Hello, everybody. And here we are again. What is Spirit Part 4? And we're going to dig into uh, the understanding of the Grail mysteries by approaching it from manifold vantage points based on the work of Dr. Rudolf Steiner. And I'm here with my good friend, Joe Visconti, out in Connecticut, in Hartford, West Hartford. West Hartford. That's like uh, Collective Central. <laughs> and here I am in, in the merry old state of Michigan, uh, north of the Straits, Detroit, Detroit. And we're here and we're gonna see if we can kind of shed some light for our own sake, at least, at the very least. Hopefully, people could follow along and, and perhaps gain some new insights. Uh, I should probably give a, a few words leading into this that will give you an idea of our trajectory, so to speak. Uh, this is from the Wonders of the World, Ordeals of the Soul, Revelations of the Spirit, Lecture 10, Two Poles of All Soul Ordeals, the Macrocosmic Christ Impulse in the Meaning of St. Paul. And in there, and I quote, the laws of Kepler are biological laws, will inevitably appear to our descendants to be as much a mythology as that of the Greeks, unless these descendants of ours are enabled through a wider outlook on the world to perceive that each kind of explanation is justified in its turn. The great arrogance of our age, which maintains that mythology is fantasy and our own science, a definitive explanation of the universe will be overthrown. And will be seen that our own time, just like earlier ones, only represents a phase which in its turn has to be superseded. But when we consider our own intellectual explanation of the world, an explanation which is generally called science, one has to say that it is just this explanation of the world, intellectual in form and idea, which is least able to enter into the realities. We must seriously try to discover why this is so, end quote. And so that's quite a comment. And in frequently when Joe and I talk, we talk about the old analogy of a, there's a tree and you're, you're describing it from different vantage points. You know, this guy over here, he's writing a poem and this guy's making a painting and guy in the back's got a camera and they're all approaching this subject but they're limited to the things that are within their field of perspective. And so that's how you have to kind of look at the way in which Rudolf Steiner approaches modern science, because basically the, the gist of what he says, and I, I only paraphrase, is that in science, they take factual information and he says they get the facts right, the actual facts, it's just when they try to interpret what it means. And so that's where it gets complicated. So how you doing there, Joe? Pretty good. It's a beautiful day. We had a lot of rain here the last couple of days and a cold uh, spell in Connecticut. West Hartford, Connecticut, home of Noah Webster. That's right, folks, the Noah Webster Dictionary. That and the Bible until 1935 are the two most popular books on all American shelves. Yeah right across the country so uh that's where it all happened right here in good old hartford the insurance capital of the world <laughs> but uh, you hit on some great points about science and as you were speaking john and we've talked about this so much and studied so much on this a couple factors came into my mind from our talks and also from rudolf steiner one of them was that um when you look at something and science knows this in, they notice under the microscope, as we perceive it, it changes. 
Uh, and that's that has to do with the world. That has to do with anything that you look at. We have an effect on things that we study and that we meditate on, and um, and that's just one way to take a peek at everything we will talk about and everything we will ever read about and realize that it can change with our observation. And that's what science is, observing. Um, and, the, and the second thing was something you and I have spoken about. It's, uh, it's about the rainbow, we'll call the rainbow men, uh, another principle here that could, uh, in the big picture, transform our talks or anyone's talks. And that is that as the rainbow appears because the conditions of the world, Rudolf Steiner speaks about this, uh, the conditions are right for the rainbow to appear. The human being is appearing because of certain conditions and our bodies, other bodies are all intersecting. I want you to really go off on this one in a second. But because of that, um, we have to take a look at the fact that the illusion, the Maya, um, is in the one hand of what we see, the um, the um, apparent versus the appearance of things. Uh, and Steiner goes off on this too, taking a hard look when you meditate to see what's apparently there versus the appearances. And if you couple that with the observation technique I spoke about, then everything we will look at, we have to hold those in our minds um, as a very important um almost like channel markers when you're going in and out of the channel to not forget that the effect of these has on everything we're about to discuss. Pitching it back to you. <laughs> You caught me digging something up. I just barely, uh -huh. barely made a recovery there. Okay, okay. I figured you were. I knew you were doing something. And this is this is the conversation. We're not playing hockey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> although that would be fun. Yes. So you have that, and and on my other show with with one of my other shows, my most frequent show with with uh, Reverend David. Perry, uh, it, it's called What is Truth? And that is an endless subject. And here we have in What is Spirit? And, and we're making reference directly to the Grail Mysteries. And Rudolf Steiner, in his main uh, book that can be considered as a response to the science of his day, is, is the esoteric uh, science and outline, or it's originally called occult science and outline, occult meaning that which is hidden. And so he had said of this book, and I and I repeat this, but I I repeat it because it's a really important thing to to be able to grasp when you're to making an assessment, making an evaluation of the things of which Rudolf Steiner speaks, because he. He says, and I'm just going to paraphrase because rather than look it up, uh, it's much easier. But he, as I've said before, he was considered to be a protege of Haeckel. Haeckel is uh, one of the principal uh, scientists, along with Charles Darwin, who came up with that whole evolutionary theory. And so you have this uh, counterpoint between the, the creationists and, and the evolution uh, and there's a third perspective, and that third perspective is that which relates to the work of Rudolf Steiner, because as Steiner was considered by Haeckel to be his protege and to continue his work after him, all of a sudden Rudolf Steiner started lecturing at the Theosophical Society, and like Haeckel's like, what is going on here? You know, it's like he was shocked, you know, and Rudolf Steiner had said uh, upon a, a later occasion, after he'd written Occult Science, he said that through studying with Haeckel, because again, Haeckel's a development out of the metamorphosis concepts of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe about whom we've spoken on many, many occasions. And this whole idea of metamorphosis, but what is the nature of that metamorphosis? And Rudolf Steiner said that what he did was he studied and really grappled with the ideas of Haeckel and, and all the thinkers pertaining to that particular subject and 
took it to the spiritual world and the book Occult Science and Outline was the response of the spiritual world. And in that book, he said, were it to have another name, it would be uh, Grail, the Holy Grail. The Grail Science essentially is what it is. And it's, it's on other occasions, he refers to it as a Christ language and that it gives us ways in which we can carry ideas and, and concepts that we confront in, in the world or originate out of our own being and take them and, and offer them up to Christ as a question. And that's the quest, that the grail is a quest. You're, you're looking with wonder at the world and searching for questions, refining your questions. The answers keeps receding, so to say you're searching for answers. Well, yeah, you are in your own naive way. You think you are. You think you're going to get closure in the way in which you're framing your ideas at the current time. But in the future, as the vistas open up and, and you realize once again that you're, you're actually a spiritual being having a physical ex experience, there's going to be a lot more input that's going to be uh, part of your understanding of the world. Uh, were you to pursue the path of, of coming into relationship to the Christ impulse? Because it, you, you do have the option of, of denying the Christ impulse and just going with the material ev evolution and just becoming a kind of a biological bot, if that's your idea of a good time. But so these are these are difficult ideas, but uh, Rudolf Stein is very careful to assert that uh, all that's needed is is a healthy suspension of disbelief. And that that's interesting about the about this this approach. And what frightens many in materialistic science is that they sit in a lab or at their desktop and they study and they ponder for one answer. In, in the realms that make up the universe, there are more than one answer to questions at different levels. And so when you begin to get into Rudolf Steiner or many of the mysteries and wonder, as you open your mind, you have to have a, almost like a prerequ prerequisite condition, preheat your oven, to 300 degrees before you start to cook that uh, what's going to come in will maybe coming into you and you have to be receptive to receive what the hierarchies want to bring into your questions uh, and be open to them. And it's almost like if you're at six flags on the Superman ride and you have to keep your center about yourself while you're zigging around in the Superman roller coaster ride where science is petrified to do that. It's, Positioned itself stationary, non-movement, as though it can still the world, and it's looking for just the one answer. And so the conditions in the mind of the observer, of the scientist, of any scientist or any person who wants to study something, that's what science means, the study of something, um, they're petrified and afraid of more than one. They don't know this, but they're afraid of more than one answer. And so today, under certain astrological uh, correspondence, we may be able to receive something at a certain time of the day, certain time of the month, something totally different than we would at another time. But when the question comes to us, almost like karma or a uh, yearning to know, it's at that moment that so much is occurring behind our consciousness, but we have to not be afraid to receive it, hold it, understand it, collect it, make it part of ourselves, but yet at the same time realize we're still on a Superman ride and there's more things to discover and there's ways to not be afraid of the path. And it's the really the fear that reduces the scientist, the materialistic scientist into wanting that one answer, that one and one is two only. Yes, I wrote out is very clear that he said that scientist arises out of fear. He says that. And you think about that. And I mean, what a brilliant statement. And I don't believe anybody else has ever said that before him, because that really 
gives you an inkling of, of how science is related to wonder and, and striving to, to come to a relationship to that which you wonder about and find the answer. But the difficulty with that, and that's why studying Rudolf Steiner is easily the most difficult subject that you could study. And if you don't believe me, just spend 50 plus years studying it like I have. <laughs> and uh, other, other subjects, you know, like physics, uh, most physics books were written by college students and they spend the rest of their life defending their thesis until it gets shot down by somebody with a new thesis incorporating some new observation. And in understanding the difference, it's important to understand that Rudolf Steiner presents his ideas within the context of a, a Christology that is a cosmology. It's, it's the science of time. And he says, that at the ascension and resurrection, that one of the aspects of what Christ gave to mankind was he gave back time, that there was a way of entering into a relationship with time that was uniquely pertaining to the, the mission of the Christ. And that it's this whole idea of that metamorphosis, that unfoldment, that there is a it, that there is a creation, the creation story is true, and that there is an evolution, that there's both. But right. it's the way in which they combine that's unique. And so you can't put Rudolf Steiner's description, his, his Weltanschauung, his worldview, with one or the other. It's, it's unique in that regard. Yeah, yeah. And it's unique in, in esotericism because if you study a lot of uh, esoteric writers, you, you'll realize that very few of them actually have a cosmology. They don't have a science of time. That Maybe they have it privately and they didn't include it in their book. I don't know. But it, it becomes pretty clear when you're dealing with an author who doesn't understand the nature of time. You know, I had an experience this morning having coffee with a good friend of mine. We kind of have coffee a few times a week. And and this is about what's really happening through this grail, the grail mysteries. They are becoming, I don't know how to put this into words, because this is another aspect of seeking, is that the institutions, the religious institutions, uh, our governments, everything is falling away. It's now becoming onto uh, all mankind individually, and hopefully in certain groups, just through friendships or whatever, all freely being done. We are searching now on our own. So it will not be, although we try to be a one world government totalitarian, in juxtaposition to that, there will be individuals that are all seeking on their own, uh, which is really interesting. So we were having coffee, and I said, to my friend, his name is Seth. And um, I said, Seth, you know, we talked about the religions and do you think people, you know, what do they think anymore as they leave the religions or don't practice? And you, you know, there's so many people that go to tarot card readers and palm readers and psychics, you know, what are they looking for? You know, and, and so we did a test with this lady sitting next to us. And I said, ma'am, hi. She was feeding her child. I said, Could, would you be our guinea pig? And she said, sure. I said, we're talking about psychics and tarot and the otherworldliness of information that comes through them. Have you ever gone to one? She goes, no, I haven't. But, you know, I saw a blog or a podcast on that that I'm very interested in looking into about what that means. And so we looked at my friend and I, I said, thank you. We looked at each other and I said, you see the, the key word she said, I always say it, is the interest. Are you interested in God? Are you interested in the hierarchies? Are you interested in the world behind the world, the grail, the Christ? Are you interested in that and if you're not if you don't open your interest or you don't have it then it's it's not there for you and um and it was just amazing to see her being she didn't say curious she said i'm interested in watching that to discover how it works etc 
and 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 I'm not trying to push psychics, but what I mean is, in in the um, in the absence of organized religion, and it still exists, but it's really waning more and more. And government is trying to push it completely out of everyone's lives right now. Education, etc. Um, more and more people may try to figure out on their own because they're all having intuitive experiences. Everyone is right now. We're being bombarded beyond advertisement. We're bombarded every day with stop because you're being pressed into decision making. What should I do? And you're asking quickly and I'll go here. I'll go there. You don't even know why you're doing these choices yet. So this one-on-one -on -one with the spiritual world is what I'm addressing here. It, I believe it's prevalent. It's taking on a different form. It's becoming individualized. And, um, and I'd love you to respond to that one, John. <laughs> Well, it's elsewhere. Rudolf Steiner says that the the divine spiritual beings do not like to be ignored, and so we've spent the last few hundred years developing a, a secular culture uh, where people concern themselves with worldly things, and over time, people have started to lose their connection uh, with whatever religious background they come out of. And so it's that's a part of individuation though, that they can actually kind of consolidate themselves as an individual ego. But the Rudolf Steiner elsewhere says that the, the challenge of, of this current period of time is the uh, excess development of egoism. And that, that's a result of that materialistic outlook and he said again elsewhere that were we to just limit our thoughts to those thoughts that are brain bound thoughts we'd spend all our time thinking about uh you know satisfying eating uh and and fulfilling uh all the various cravings of the body and all of that so they, they wouldn't have something beyond that but that if you come to a deeper understanding of what Rudolf Steiner says about the nature of thinking, then you could see that there's this whole vista that can be opened up once one begins to expand your thinking to where you can go beyond just brain-bound thinking. And of course, the, the perhaps most direct way that I know of to do that is just reading the works of Rudolf Steiner and attempting to try and think the thoughts, try to understand what he's saying. And in doing that, it necessitates that you expand your thinking, that you can't just take all the, the shall we say, corridors of thought that you're used to traveling down. Uh, you won't find direct answers down those corridors because you have to be able to incorporate new concepts, new ideas, new imaginations, and also new activities. So that this whole idea of coming to a deeper understanding of what is a human being? And, and that's a good question to ask because has anybody, we were born, we didn't have an instruction manual and we have all these people that now we realize we don't know if we could trust them because they, they've been lately given us some, some uh, information that's pretty off base. And so I, I guess I'm on my own in figuring this out. Well, that's the way I've looked at it well, most of my life is that I'm on my own. I got to figure this out because I can't depend. I, could just, I can't just go to school and somebody's going to tell me what's going on here. Well, it gets back to our Constitution, the pursuit of happiness. Well, that's what kind of goal is that in our time versus 200 years ago? What was pursuit of happiness? Being able to eat, being able to not worry, be afraid for your life back then versus today. What is the pursuit of happiness as we delve more and more into materialism? And and um, but something I think is really again, I'm looking at the positive side of things that I believe are are occurring and um, in. As the baby boomers, 1945 to 1964, about 20 years, as they age out and uh, 
the youngest ones will be in two years. The 1964 group will be 60 years old, and the 1945 will be um, almost 90, um, 80, late 80s. So what's happening is death, meeting your maker, they're beyond Social Security, and especially with this huge rap in America, this huge group of Americans, as they push into different meanings of their life, and not just retirement and going to brunch in, in, in relation to what's happening in the world, and their whole outlook, the reflective part, the part that knows they're going to die, the, there now are really no religions to go back to. The churches uh, are empty. Um, so death. In meeting your maker, meeting death, uh, beyond the fear, the questions, I think it's very right for people to now, uh, at the, in that age, right, that huge group of Americans to um, to start. And there's going to be an effect on the, on the masses because of that group wanting to know beyond just existentialism, this is real. We're going. You know, you're on that ship that's uh, going to land on uh, Omaha Beach. That door is going to open in a ramp, and you're getting out. And what's going to be there? It's fearful, but it's also unknown. And I really think these are the times when so much of Rudolf Steiner's works, so much of, of, of other, you know, mystics, of you name it, uh, people are going to search in ways where they, they want to understand uh, if they can what's coming for them. They had no idea of the things that Steiner speaks about and rebirth, death, rebirth, and all that. So part of this grail mystery is is moves here, and you see death everywhere within the, the Holy Grail. But why don't you address that, John, uh, what, you, what your feelings are about, because I keep going back to the positive in in relation to so much negative that's happening in the world. There are things that are occurring that just aren't, they're not uh, quantified, measured, uh, able to be measured. And so therefore, in the mind of the media and the public, they don't exist. Yet they do. Well, it goes back to what Oswald Spengler here is asking. He says, don't you think mysticism can be secular, Mr. B? Absolutely. You know, it. it that's... Again, going back to the, the uh, my introduction here about the tree and approaching it from different directions so that you have to accommodate uh, that there are other viewpoints regarding whatever it is you're attempting to develop a conceptual basis. Uh, but people that are, are more secular inclined, perhaps not rel particularly religious, uh, Rudolf Steiner's book, The Philosophy of Freedom, or the philosophy of spiritual activity, it's also titled, just to go through the path of pure thinking. And by the way, that it was the path that Rudolf Steiner himself uh, used to be able to develop his tremendous capacities of, of uh, clairvoyant perception of the spiritual world. Because essentially, what is it? It's, a, it's essentially a guidebook on how to think like an angel. I mean, seriously, he doesn't say that, but that if you look at it, that's what it is. Because once thinking can think about itself, it it has a once removed vantage point to the realm of thinking. And by having that once removed vantage point, it's it gets beyond just the, the brain bound aspects of thinking so that it can develop into uh, what is a source of, of intuition. It's the path of intuition, moral intuition, essentially. And that's important to emphasize because he speaks about moral imagination, moral inspiration, and moral intuition. He many times talks about imagination, inspiration, and intuition. But it's important to keep in mind that, that moral word because that's, that's the glue of the universe. Uh, Buckminster Fuller said that love is the glue of the universe, that it's it's that which is, is that's that's that connective tissue. That's that's that element of concern for the other. And it's it's through the bondiest love of Christ that he was able to go through the mystery of Golgotha and make the supreme sacrifice for those uh, on earth here. And 
he didn't have to do that. It was a free deed on his part. And by him being able to enact a free deed, created a template for us to be able to be free beings, and to, but to freely come unto him. And that gets a little confusing to people, but it's he's given you that freedom to be able to make the mistakes. It's, it's come as a result of your relationship to the, the powers of the adversaries that, that can direct you into making decisions that perhaps are less than ideal. And, but that, that capacity to be able to make mistakes is, is the greatest value. That's the pearl in the oyster because it's only through getting sand in the, in the oyster that irritates the clam that it creates this, this pearl to surround that, that grain of sand so it no longer is irritating. And so again, it's like that's, that's on a level of a clam uh, or an oyster, the, the, uh, that's their version of, of wonder, approaching wonder. How do, I, how do I solve this situation? How do I approach this situation? What is necessary that I, I take up? You know, like you, you have like the prayer of, the, of Christ's breastplate, you know, that's the, the prayer of St. Patrick where he says, and I shared it last week, but Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ to my left, Christ to my right, Christ below me, Christ above me, Christ within me. It's that affirmation, that, that conscious returning to, to the fold. It's the prodigal son returned to the father. And, and that's that whole idea that you're, but you're free to do it. And Ritter Steiner was very clear when he made the point about how we should approach these these things. And there's, if I could find it, uh, you know, because he says the love of truth is the only love that sets the ego free and stops self-seeking. And so in understanding this relationship to truth, what did I do here? I'm almost... Uh, <laughs> I almost vacated the screen. I found the wrong thing. So I'm going to continue looking here. While you look, let me jump in over here. Yeah, uh, while you're looking, uh, the, the, I always look at the what's called the, the helpfulness, the benefits, the dangers of certain things. In the secular world today, here's the um, enticement. And here's what people really want to, almost like politics, they want to run away from the party system and not confront it, at least publicly. They kind of want things that they want and they don't want the, the drama that goes with politics. The secular world looks to make things so that we don't need to mention the name of Christ. So we don't need, need to mention God. We can remove that. That's Mr. Ahriman, pure and simple, seeking to strip away the cosmic Christ and the spiritual realm with its realities that this this realm comes from. So as we look to strip that away in the appearance and benefit of not wanting to offend others who don't want to be Christian, not the religion, but really Christian as the center of the universe, uh, whatever you want to call Christ, what occurs is immediately there's a stripping away of the cosmogony of the universe, where it came from, how it exists in reality. And there's not even the attempt to build that. There is only now a vacuum in secularism to make ordinances and make rules and policies and laws because there's always going to come. And then you go right back to Leviticus. You go back to organized religion or call it government. And so as the secular world is constantly, if you could have a pure one, it'd be great, but you can't. You almost like you can't have a pure socialistic or communistic state. It doesn't work. It's a nice idea. It doesn't work. So secularism on its own lacks the lacks a part of the truth. It's a it's a, a knockoff of a Gucci bag. 
it's not the real thing. It's trying to be like that without without the expense or without the reality of the real Gucci bag on Fifth Avenue when you're on the street and you buy the knockoff. And that's what the secularism is always falls prey to. And it's just a vacuum for demons. It's a vacuum for malevolent forces to get in. And we're all going to be almost, almost like um, in politics with this, um, you know, this thing they're trying to do where we have diversity. <laughs> Everything's diverse. Why are you trying to force something diverse in the time when no one cares about that anymore? We all love each other in term marriages, but there's this thing of diversity. Well, that's what occurs with secularism. It just opens the way for rules, ordinances, laws, policies, dictates to step in, and they're not aligned with the cosmos, which is what this is all about, the grail. And what times we're living in, uh, dark forces would like us not to believe in the cosmic Christ in the spiritual world. Only the kingdoms of this world, one of the temptations of Christ, bow down to me and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. Yes, when you go, when you go back to scripture and you see that uh, the difficult relationship that Jesus had with the scribes and the Pharisees, right? The scribes being those in the Judaic community that were attempting to try and, and come up with uh, a way that fit the Roman Empire. And the Pharisees were the, the uh, Hebraic purists. And they, so they were always in arguments with each other about you know what was what was the real path, and so uh, whereas Christ is he was beyond that you see, sure. and when he goes back and he gives the golden rule you know love God with all your heart mind and and love mankind as yourself is like then you kept all the commandments so that's like. That's like a eureka moment, really. It's it's a, a actual conceptual grounding of the birth of conscience, and that conscience is that actual impulse that that the in the work of Rudolf Steiner he describes how that the individual human ego, the true ego, was donated out of the substance of divine spiritual beings. And so it's it's actually a reality on a deeper level than the spirits of the opposition that are developed out of the ideas of the divine spiritual beings. Like if you could figure out what I just said, you've really made some progress in your understanding because that's how it's necessary to look at these things to be able to go, well, what is all this stuff with, you know, like Lucifer and Satan or Araman, as he's called in Persian? What is this? And that you, ha you always have in within the creation impulse that there's a, a binary development because you have the divine spiritual outpouring. But if it was only that, there would be no freedom and everybody would be like these really well-behaved puppets. And that's not the goal. The goal is for us to be able to develop to where we have the freedom and the capacity to do things out of our own free initiative. And, and that goal is the quest. It is the quest of the grail, the goal. And this is what's lacking when the cosmogony isn't built or on truth, on reality, in the search to understand Cosmogony is the universe and where it came from, how it came to be. And how is it, not mine, like Pilate says, not your truth, what is your truth versus mine. It is the truth, the way the world is. The butterflies, the reptiles, the spiritual entities, sylph, salamanders, undines, all the things that are in the world where you say, I can't. Well, some people can see them. I may be able to see them, someone else, but it's not a proven measurable thing. And this is where... Armin gets us again, because if you don't have measure, number, and weight, it doesn't exist. Can't buy it, can't sell it, can't lawfully lock it up, 
can't do away with it, censor it. So it has to have that. And we're delving in ideals and ideas that have to do with a cosmogony that's invisible, which is the spirit. That's what we're talking about. And what is spirit? It's life and consciousness beyond the organic process. And this is so important with the ethers. And what does that mean? Well, how could you have life? It's all over the Bible. What do you mean? Uh, um, everlasting life, immortal life, life abundantly. What are they talking about? What is this life? How could there be life? I'd love to discuss that. How could there be life without the organic biological process? And how could there be consciousness without a brain or a biological consciousness? And this is what spirit is. This is what these thoughts are. This is where our universe came from and beyond. And yet people, if they don't have the religions which have failed and they took us so far, and the governments and their institutions and academia have said nothing about this, then secularly we'll remove all of this and then we won't be able to talk about how we can't talk about half of the things that are happening in politics right now on news media so now more and more censoring of not just our policies but there will be more and more censoring about christ about the spiritual realm it doesn't exist because Armin would love to give you all the kingdoms of the world as long as you do not believe there is a heaven a cosmic christ and there's a spiritual world that your soul came from and goes to yes absolutely and uh riddle steiner in uh his collected works volume three truth and knowledge which was really the first book that he wrote and that was even before the philosophy of freedom he says untruthfulness has everywhere become a quality of the age it is impossible to describe truth as a characteristic of our times. And that's like a, a strong <laughs> statement, you know. All right. It's everything. And he's saying this in response to all the, the high-level academics and all of that. And mind you, he ended up becoming the editor of Goethe's scientific works. But later on, he clarified the subject uh, even further, he said in uh, the lecture from January 18th, 1920 in GA 196, uh, it was entitled, Some Conditions for Understanding Supersensible Experiences. He says, and I quote, the moment untruthfulness asserts itself, the supersensible experiences fade away without being understood. And so you see that that's, it's that whole idea of it's a participatory consciousness. You have to be able to have, you have to set the table, the grail, there's a, the grail table also, and, and the grail rests on a table. Why, it, well, why is that grail there? It's there to receive. And so that, that whole idea like, uh, for example, in the Jewish tradition, they have the Kabbalah. Well, Kabbalah means to receive. So it's it's a receptacle. It's something that is capable of holding something. And, and you take your hand, uh, you take your hand on the chalice consciously and, and grab and hold with your will that which is in that's being asked for to receive. We're participating with this and and it's another thing, John, is important at this point, and you just spoke about participatory. This has to do with the Holy Spirit. This has to do with mankind. Love your neighbor as yourself. It has to do with others because our karma made before we were born is all inclusive through the angelic kingdoms into our daily lives, our daily bread, all amongst each other. So it's not something that you can, you, we, are, we think for ourselves maybe, but it is something that every time we think we have to think of the others. What is that doing to my brother? Are my brothers and sisters all where I am searching? Where are they going wrong? Am I my brother's keeper? Should I speak up and say something politically or say something like we are on the show? Should we just stay silent or should we offer up through the sub-physical world, this computer here, should we offer up information that could be helpful? And why would we want to do that? Because it's part of our calling. It's part of our quest for the grail. Everyone has to come to the grail 
It's important. It happens how they get there and when they get there and the way they awaken is up to God and them. Yeah, Mary says, I found Steiner's work about a year ago. It just clicked. Mostly etheric Christ in the grail. Times I think, no, I overdid it. Blew my mind. LOL, that's okay. Yeah, it is going to blow your mind because so often, and I, I've said this time and time again, I used to, I, when in the early days for me back, uh, you know, I found out about it in junior high. It took me a while to get gain access to things. It wasn't as easy back then to, to find Rudolf Steiner's materials, but I started out with, uh, the work of the angels and man's astral body is a lecture that is, it paints a, a picture of your relationship to your guardian angel. And another one that I, I read over and over again was the etherization of the blood and coming into understanding that there's this miraculous event that enables uh, your consciousness to not be limited. Remember, I was talking about that brain bound thinking that if we just limited ourselves to that, we'd always be like trying to figure out what, what we're going to eat next. And, you know, it's just totally caught in the world of the senses. But Rudolf Steiner talks about and the, working from that etherization of the blood lecture ultimately led to my involvement in, in the heart research that I did with Ralph Marinelli, where we were able to prove that the heart was not a pump. So things can have fruits that, of which you can't even imagine how there, that it would come about, right? I, you, you not only don't know, you don't know you don't know. You're, <laughs> you're so removed from it that you don't, you don't have a, a sufficient relationship to it to be able to develop uh, a conceptual uh, basis to approach it. And and I continually go back to uh, the whole idea of closed sets and open sets. And then an open set, it automatically assumes that you don't have all the information. And so you have to withhold coming to a final opinion regarding the subject you're approaching because there's more information that you don't have. And there's there's also the uh, walking into Steiner takes a lot of fortitude and there's some pitfalls. And remember, I love stories that happen in real life because they they're what books are made of and they people relate to them. But if you just walk into it and find it, you have to just be careful that the minute you I, I don't want to say be careful, but what could occur? This is important. Um, a good friend of mine, I was dating this lady a few years ago, and I don't know what kind of subject. She wasn't into this. She didn't even know I was into this, and and she into Steiner and all that. And she said, uh, well, now we got on the subject of Christ, and I sent her an article from Google on the reappearance of Christ in the etheric. And it was probably a three-pager put out by someone uh, in the organization. And she clicked it on, read it, and she just she had religious background, but that's about it. She flipped out. Oh my God, she jumped up off the couch. Oh my God, oh my God. Everything in her life and the world, it made sense to her. She was ready to hear it and all these pieces fell into place. And it wasn't a week later that, never mind us, it was more of, um, I, you know, we talked about it and she was, and I don't know what happened. So when you, you can have an awakening, and so if you do, hold on, <laughs> because when that comes in, if you're not conditioned over years and decades with a Rudolf Steiner, and even if you do, you could have an awakening and you'll notice that, I won't call it an attack, but there is definitely something that, a counterforce that can come in and not harm you, but make you go so that you almost forget it, it disappears, you got to write it down. Um, it's almost like something wants to take. I don't. I won't get into the darker forces, but and so those who were maybe turned on by the things we're doing or onto Rudolf Steiner, uh, it's it's not a warning. It's just be observant of how how these you know when it comes into you because it's always, and people have the capacity to know these things quickly today. Pick up a three page article and you can synthesize it in your mind if you have no no information about it and go. Oh my God, I get it. I see it. Holy smokes! That's what appearing in the clouds means. Oh, 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 oh. And so without even a lot of depth of Rudolf Steiner anthroposophy, but then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sure John's got some stories. So all those that are getting turned on by this uh, Rudolf Steiner character, uh, 
<laughs> just be wary of when you first jump in that there's so much and don't uh, don't forget write it down <laughs> yeah especially you know when you you know it ha it often happens that people like say uh, the 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 wife discovers Rudolf Steiner and then she hits a brick wall when when she tries to share what she's been thinking about with her husband that's that's a, a common or vice versa and so you really don't know it, what it could do is and and remember Christ said you know I've come to separate the son from the father the the daughter from the mother and that 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 that's we're, we're going beyond just blood association here. You're, what you're getting into is being able to find uh, your community, so to speak, the people that uh, can uh, sense or, or think about certain things that, that you think about. And we all go through changes. And you can go back over your life. I know I can over mine. I have certain circles that I moved in that, that uh, at the time were very relevant for me, but later on they weren't as relevant. And not it's not passing judgment one way or the other. Right. It's just to one's interests change, you know. It's like uh, you know, once I got to a certain age, I put my train set away. I wish I still had it. I'd probably <laughs> be really valuable Lionel train, you know. But uh, it, that's the point is that it, it's like you know, yeah, I'm a, I was very much in the music business played a lot of blues and all that but what do i do now i listen to mostly like beethoven and chopin and, and wagner things like that you know so it's it all depends on on what you're working on and that's that whole idea of, of being gentle with yourself regarding the mysteries of time because you'll go through changes and it's okay if you if you can can uh, give yourself that centering that that is uh, offered to you freely from Christ. You know, yes. that, that He's there for you. He, he said, "I shall be with you, you know, to the end of the earth." And it's, that it, it wasn't a metaphor. It, it's not. It's not a road race. The information, the data, the knowledge, the wisdom, the transformation of your own self happens in life and time. So don't let the pressures of these two opposing powers of Lucifer and Armin play you like a like a, you're in a tennis, you know, what do you call it, ping pong, and you're the net. Don't get drawn in. There is no winning by merit, by knowing more than this one or accumulating more. It's so much more. Every every day is another vista, another horizon, another little trail you turn down you see a different view it's life and it needs to be integrated with our personal lives with our personal biographies it works there and so a lot of the pitfalls also are people coming out of this almost like in college or with academia that if i put four years in and i study this much and i get this much quantified knowledge then i'll get a degree because i passed these courses whereas like you know remember uh uh, back to the future three where we're going to know there are no roads where we are there are no degrees <laughs> except for the grail and that is the living thing and it's not going to be quantified by man and or acknowledged by man and so you have to be able to almost like that superman roller coaster just go with it just don't fight it center yourself love it every day be great i think the key word is gratefulness gratefulness these are common things that you find in all your religions and the way we were raised and they don't get removed because you're discovering mysteries and you're seeking to discover mysteries they'll come the way they come you'll find your own but so many people um abandon i talked about this on another program last week uh earlier this week how people abandon their faith they abandon many things to try to get into something new and this new thing well there are no new things it's it's these secrets are open they're out in the world i think rudolf steiner says somewhere that the initiation rights everything is is they're open secrets if you saw them for rights of initiation if you saw them because they're in front of you and through conjecture you put them, you would laugh at them. They would be so ridiculous. So it's spread out in the world. This is not, they call it hidden because it's hidden from our consciousness because we're not interested and we're not asking for the hierarchies in Christ to come forward to show us these mysteries as we are prepared to receive them. Because again, too much knowledge or the wrong knowledge at the 
at the wrong time, you want to make sure that it's always with the blessing of the hierarchies that we get, we're content and we're grateful for that which we get. And we can share with our brothers and sisters some things that may help them um, in these talks, in books, in just your daily activities. Yes, it's, and just to, to get beyond the point to where one has apprehension about dedicating yourself to this grail path, essentially, that you have to uh, come to an understanding where there's a certain sense of commitment to yourself, that you've, you've made a decision. And, and what does Goethe say? He says, first commit, then the whole world will rise to assist you. And so it's that whole idea of that you can have a formal relationship to the way in which your world unfolds by developing uh, a capacity to be able to be informal, that, that there's the, the, this fluidity that, that comes about in, in your thinking because, okay, I see this, but if I go over here, it looks different. You know, it's the same thing, but it's approaching it from another perspective. And you'll see in the work of Rudolf Steiner that what makes it challenging for many people, most subjects you study, they give you, okay, this is the definition of this word. This word means this. And it's just, the book is basically a compilation of the way in which they stack all these definitions. And Rudolf Steiner is more of an artist and he's, again, approaching it from this perspective, now from another perspective, and so on, and all through, you know, thousands of lectures, and, you know, I'll come to a, an understanding and think, aha, I figured it out, and then, you know, five years later, I'll come across this one lecture, and I'll read something and realize that I was 180 degrees out of kilter, that, that I, I was incorrect in my, my assumption and the way that my mind was processing, but that's okay because it's this continual unfolding. Uh, it's like a flower unfolding and, and you could look at, at a bud of a flower and, and you don't have any idea what it's gonna look like unless you know that flower because there are even better examples of seed. You look at a seed, you go, gee, I wonder what this is gonna look like. You got this little tiny little seed and it grows into this big giant tree. And so there's that whole idea of, uh, the way in which things arise, but it's it's there's a concept in Buddhism they call a dependent origination, and that's that that everything is all connected, and that connectivity that's where when they bring forward the concept of karma, that that that's very much tied into that. And Rudolf Steiner's specific mission was to be able to bring back into the Christian stream, the concepts of reincarnation and karma. And that, that that really gives you a way to be able to come to an understanding of why certain things w might happen. Why is this guy over here and I'm over there? You know, what, what is this? And that, there, that there's actual reasons why things happen. And that, that the reasons were generated by you. <laughs> that's so true but it you know going back to the the uh, grail and the path it's really in your heart if you and i don't even know how to use the word moral or good i mean why if you ask yourself why are you interested why are you interested in something why do you want to try to understand it what's making you not accept the world conception that's out there from the modern world realizing that we're going down so many wrong roads in our time and is this is important can you do anything about it yeah you can by altering your karma by understanding it and transforming it and seeking to understand you could change the timing this is what christ brings it john mentioned it earlier it's timing it's a sense of time and so you can almost like in the middle of the day you get so many chores or tasks done in an hour 
The rest of the day, it's like you don't get anything done. It's like, how could I get so much done? We've all had those spurts and those times. And this is how it works. And again, those darker forces, those opposing forces, I should call them, are always seeking to pull us out of time and space and rip us apart, bring anxiety and fear and doubt so that we are off-centered and Christ and the hierarchies cannot come in. Relax, chill, go easy. It's there. It can be done like that. If it, it, The first cause, the first love, the first idea came through Christ. And for those who can't handle the, the word in the name Christ, that may be a problem for a lot of people in anthroposophy and other places. But it isn't the Christ I'm speaking about that they try to tell us in church, even though it's the historical. We're talking about the cosmic being. And this is so important. I'm saying you cannot eliminate him. You could not want to call him that. But, and you want to call it something else, but the closer you get to understanding the reality uh, of what it is, it's our friend, it's our brother. He's our brother and friend now, and we, we need to change our relationship to him um, and treat it that way. Yeah, understanding that in, within the context of Christology, it's okay to be you. It's okay. You don't have to be somebody else to be you. And and that's something that, that people have a hard time with because they they tend to want to try and put you down a certain path. You know, it's the old scribes and the Pharisees again. Well, no, there it says right here that you're supposed to do this or that. Okay. Well, there are things that, uh, in, in going to, again, to the wonders of the world, that particular lecture cycle, I, I like to joke that there's two kinds of anthroposophists. There's people that have read that lecture cycle, and, and there's the ones that haven't, because it has ideas that are so fundamental, but it's such a difficult lecture cycle. I think that Joe will agree with me. We joke about it frequently because it tends to carry you away, basically. Don't listen to it while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> You'll end up in the wrong state. Happened to me in Vermont driving on earphones on 4th of July, coming back to Connecticut, the most beautiful day, and I can concentrate and I can open even while I'm driving or whatever, but holy smokes i mean the spirit's coming in hard with that and it'll knock you out because you know we're not e used to eating that kind of life and healing because that's what comes through with these truths while we're awake and that's what a lot of steiner is about it's so heavy it knocks people out they can't go through a page or two they think they're bored and they go unconscious and they fall asleep he's so boring he's not boring you can't stay alert because you're so, i'll just call it your your, your lower self or your soul, however you want to, whatever word you want to call it, is saying to you, hey, listen, we usually get rejuvenated life forces when you're unconscious. I need you to go to sleep. <laughs> and you go to sleep because you're not used to eating this food while you're conscious. And again, that's part of the grail, to be remain erect and conscious while you do this. Muted. Uh, sounds of silence there. Oh, what happened? As Novalis said, he said, "When you when you dream, you are dreaming. You are nearly awake." And so it's that whole idea that there's these different states of being. As like Rene Ganon described, the multiple states of being, and he does quite a uh, interesting job articulating it. But he doesn't have a cosmology, not really. And so you can only you can only go so far studying uh, the, the traditionalist authors because they don't have uh, a developed cosmology like to be found in the works of Rudolf Steiner or in Madame Blavatsky. Of course, hers is very chaotic, her interpretation of it. And and then C.G. Harrison in the Transcendental Universe. That's the three, your three primary sources for being able to uh, enter into this particular subject we're attempting to address today, because if you don't understand that, that, that you have a physical body, and, and most people, they know what that is, because they're 
they're looking at it almost all the time. But then you also have a, a life body. That's the body that you share with the plant kingdom. And that's the, the source of memory. And that's how you can bring ideas to consciousness because the, the actual ideation process is from the astral. And that's something that you share with the animals, but it's the capacity of the astral to be able to reflect its impressions on the etheric body that you can even uh, be cognizant of the things that, that you're perceiving. And so this is what he's talking about. And so when you, when you begin to study Rudolf Steiner, you can go into a situation where there's a, a, a subtle modification uh, of the relationship between your astral body, etheric body, and your physical body, because the astral body is streaming to you out of the future, whereas the etheric body is reflecting the past. And so you have the, your ego, is it's like riding in this chariot, right, with the with the three horses, you got the physical, and you got the etheric and the astral. And so the, it's important to understand the ego is none of those things, okay? It's participating in them. It has dependent origination relationship to those things. But it is something that has been given to you as a gift through a deed of Christ working through the little divine spiritual beings so that they donate out of their own substance something that is inherently you. And you can negate that. You can walk away from the responsibility of being a, an individuated Christ being. You know, as, as St. Paul says, Christ in you. He's referring to uh, an objective reality in terms of of the esoteric teachings of, of the Christian stream. And this relates to the threefold understanding of the school of Dionysius, the Iapagite, that he was established in Athens, the esoteric school founded by St. Paul that in the fourth century eventually became published and then went into the court of uh, Charles the Ball, the, uh, uh, it, of the line of Charlemagne and it was translated by uh, Johannes Scotus Irigina. And so you have this, this transmission that goes eventually to Aquinas, and it's the second most quoted source in the writings of Thomas Aquinas. So what is this thing with the angels and the archangels and the archai and the, the, uh, the exousiae and dunamis and curiotites and the thrones and the a cherubim and the seraphim. What are the what are these beings that are referred to? And when you come to the work of Rudolf Steiner, you realize that your whole life is a result of the the sacrificial deeds of of all these orders of beings over immense periods of time, and that all this has been done on your behalf. And that you basically you are the religion, so to speak. Of the spiritual beings, right? That the, you're their project. They they want you to succeed. So believe it when I tell you that if you ask Christ, you shall receive. It may not be what you thought you deserved. It may not be what you thought is in response, but you will receive an answer. And you know, I've seen uh, spiritual healings. I've had them myself. I've had virtual things as a result of uh, just participating in the Eucharist. So it's, it's important to understand that from our vantage point, we're dealing with realities. These are not just uh, fairy tales for children, although fairy tales deal with more realities than most scientists. <laughs> so things are not what everybody's telling you. It's not quite that simple. And so we just want to, help people broaden their perspective to be able to include things and uh, be an artist, you know, it's, that's far more creative. I, I'd rather be a, a Beethoven than an Einstein. Well, John, that was a nice um, display of the grail, <laughs> the grail mysteries there where you just ran up there from Saturn, sun, moon, earth. Um, this is part of the grail. It's part of the understanding of who we are, who we really are beyond what we were told in school. 
and college and academia. And think about this also with these bodies that John was just discussing, medicine and science don't know they exist. And you wonder why there's side effects. And you wonder why so many drugs and different things kill us. Anthroposophical medicine, on the other hand, uh, has been working wonders and is growing more and more. And Rudolf Steiner says that medicine will become spiritualized soon. And that's when we will, John opened it up with how we'll look at science as though it was, it, we were witch doctors during our time. So the, the benefits of health, the benefits of life, um, even the karma of our time, because this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to transform through our beings individually, the karma of our times. It doesn't, things don't have to be this way. The more people that wake up that are interested and want to seek can bring the higher forces down to Christ and the hierarchies to transform our time. We don't have to suffer. It's like anything else. You don't have to go down that road if you don't want to. But if you want to willfully stay asleep and go down that road, you can. But if enough people awaken and i believe in the world there are enough people that are awakened to lots of these mysteries if they can realize there's many more and there's more i won't use the word power but might and love through christ operating in our times that's why they're transformative that's why the times we're living are so um challenging and dangerous because many forces have a lot to lose if we wake up and follow the grail Yes, I think that uh, it's part and parcel of this is, is being able to, to open one's relationship to others. Like in the, in the legend of the grail, it's important to understand that when, when Parsifal achieves the grail, he's, he brings his brother with him. And so it has to do with that whole idea of the way in which we're all connected. And uh, Rudolf Steiner frames it, he says, in our time, the most important thing is to bring forward truths, put plainly, to give lectures about truths. What people then do about this is up to their freedom. One should go no further than to lecture on, to communicate truths. Whatever consequences there, there are should follow as a free decision. Thus, as consequences follow when decisions are made out of the impulses one has on the physical plane. It is exactly the same in the case of things that can only be guided from the spiritual world itself. Wow. Yeah. I mean. And in, in our time, it is necessity. This is what I was alluding to earlier when I said the baby boomers, as they reach, you know, old age and death, it now is becoming in this, maybe not a necessity for food and clothing and, and housing because they have social security and pensions, but it's a spiritual necessity of our time. Uh, Mary has a question here. She says, I have become interested in Rosicrucian, but Leary of Misdirection, any book or person recommendations, uh, there's a lecture cycle of Rudolf Steiner's called Theosophy of the Rosicrucian, and it's it's absolutely wonderful. There's also his, his lecture cycle, uh, Rosicrucian Esotericism. And uh, that yes, that's the tradition out of which Rudolf Steiner uh, comes. That's, that's the central school of the Western mysteries, uh, the school of Comte Saint-Germain and Master Zarathustra and there's also Schizianos, and, and it's important to understand that there's a, a different path in, in the West than there is in the East, and not to be disrespectful to, to anybody because everybody, there's all these various uh, different streams in this great river of life. And so it's important to, to try and, and be honest with yourself about what you feel resonates with you and your personal path. And it may change at a different point in your life. But I ran the largest metaphysical esoteric bookstore in the world for many years, the Mayflower Bookshop. And we were, you know, I was told uh, by Michael Dobson, uh, who ran at Pacific Press, that we sold more Rudolf Steiner books than anybody in North America. And I was telling that to James Stewart, who did the Rudolf Steiner archive. He's, 
here in Michigan also. And he laughed. He said, you guys sold more starter books than anybody in the world, not just in North America. And so, which makes it clear to understand why the Anthroposophical Society moved to Michigan so that there was a lot of activity. And But the reason there was a lot of activity, I at the time we were just you know doing the best we could do you know, in our own humble way. But what it amounts to is that if you do things, you things happen, that, that you can actually can have an effect on the world. You can be a force for good. And it's just taking it up. And even being discreet, like uh, Ernfurt Pfeiffer talks about how uh, on the, the, called the Johannine Path, or the, the Rosicrucian stream has to do with uh, being, able to be in the world. You're not a monk, you know, you're in the world, you're participating in the world, but you're walking a spiritual path. And he says, on this path, to strive to uh, at least once a day, do something for somebody you don't know that you don't derive any benefit from, just to, to, to uh, unfold that understanding of that there really is a connection, that you're not entirely separate from the world, that you have this active relationship with it that could be developed in a more wholesome way if one so chooses. But I can remember times at bookstore, somebody would come in and I'd spend all this time explaining to them, show them this book, show them that book, you know, and and then uh, they take off and I never hear from them again. And then somebody else, they come in and I wasn't a particularly good day for me, and I just kind of poked a couple books at him and went back to the desk. And that ends up being the person that comes back and tells me how I changed their life. So you just don't know what the fruits are going to be. You can throw things out, they may land on stones. You just don't know. And, and the other thing is, 50 years you've been into this plus. Doug? Gabriel, myself, and many other people I know, 50 years, for those who have not picked up Steiner or picked up a few books, I, oh, I, I want to uh, testify in his defense and his behalf that, my God, no, it's not a cult. No, it's not a religion. It is really, really science, true spiritual science, science of the invisible, science of the world behind the world, and how it affects this world, and what he delivers, how he delivers it. You don't spend 50 years with this and stay with it, and and you're kind of by yourself too. So for the most part, you're on your own with a lot of, there are reading groups and all that, but many people reach levels where they are just by themselves, but Rudolf Steiner brings what nobody can bring, and he brings it in a way uh, that really is, works well with the left brain or academia of those who go to college. It's delivered in a way that it's they can receive it. It's not written um, mysteriously or vaguely. It's so, I don't know how he stays on subject matter in all of his lectures, because after you read and study them for decades, you're like, and you go back, you're like, how did he not say that about the thing that connects there? And the thing that connects there, he stays on subject, which is more willpower to do that. Uh, and then you combine them and you work them together. Then you interface the Bible over them and just about anything that you know, because he, he connects everything from Aristotle and the Greeks and the Egyptians. Everything is in there. He footnotes. And what happens is you start to recognize the vast mind and spiritual being this is you don't worship him but you're like you're in awe of what he's delivering and then you think about the beings that brought this to him and he was capable and prepared to receive from them and deliver it it's just amazing you're in awe and at the end of the day it's almost no one can you share this stuff with and so i'm glad doug and john have been doing it for years i came out of the closet last week <laughs> to start doing it a little bit with them because it's, it feels good to be able to share whoever gets what and however the spirit leads us. But Rudolf Steiner is just sent from heaven, sent from God. Yes, and if it's, if it's too much, if it's too challenging for you, that's okay. You know, perhaps uh, in your next incarnation, you'll 
be born in a, in a location that gives you access to his material, you know. And I, to me, it's like the, the ultimate dread would be to be re reincarnated in a, in a place that didn't have any Steiner books, you know. It's like be able to attempt to, to put the pieces together, you know. So it's it's really is that strongly for me. And there's there's the aspect of it that when you study his works. They, they don't work uh, until you forget about them. They don't really work in you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so it's that whole idea that you're taking this, this nourishment in and that nourishment, just like when you eat a meal, you like with the ancient Greeks, they talk about Demeter, the goddess Demeter, that she was that being that was... Uh, she was the the deity related to the process of nutrition and they and that they they also conceived that the the soul forces that arose out of that nutritive stream that that was something that was pertaining to this this demeter and that when she had her daughter persephone and persephone relates to the separating off uh, in the process of the individuation of, of a human being and that it, it, it's a gradual transition and that's the whole idea because the grail you see is it, it in one sense means gradually gradually and so there's this this gradual unfoldment through the course of history the way in which we relate to the the beings the divine spiritual beings of the spiritual world and and our relationship to the adversarial forces that this is cultivated through spiritual science so that one is able to hold these adversaries at bay and really one of the best ways to get the devil's goat is just laugh at him he can't he wilts if you laugh at him in, in the great jokers you see on television were i there i'd just be laughing at him like you got to be kidding me you you really think that? I don't believe you think that. I think somebody paid you to to say that. But I I I it's beyond me to believe that you actually think that that's what's really going on. And and the graduation, the gradation, is the blossoming of the rose, the unfolding of the rose, and it's artistic. So in your life, this spiritual knowledge. Even the things that you sh should do or receive from your own religion, they come not with straight lines and sharp curves and corners and quantified. It's a blossoming, flowering with scent and beauty and color and life. And it comes that way. And that, again, is hard to receive when you are on the Superman ride at Six Flags going around like this, trying to fit into the scientific model of thinking, thinking digitized with square lines instead of sine waves and flowing and blossoming. And that is scary, again, for the materialistic thought that God and life, but look out in the world, everything is round and the rivers turn and curve and the etheric world makes things with the suction power into droplets. Everything is round and full of life, but it blossoms and unfolds. And again, it's very fearful for this materialistic, scientific, square, straight lines, uh, period, semicolon, uh, make this all into a mechaniz mechanized um, uh, diagram. It doesn't unfold and life isn't like that why would you expect the spiritual knowledge wisdom and god in our own lives to operate in a straight line yes and we're getting near the end here and i i of course want to mention that i have two books the first book is currently out of print unfortunately joe got the last copy and in fact elaine was asking has Joe started reading your books yet? I'm sure he's been busy at the beach, <laughs> painting his boats or what have you. But uh, the Arcana of the Grail Angel, the spiritual science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, uh, with texts and diagrams and afforded by my Best buddy Douglas Gabriel, 640 pages. And uh, 
that can give you a means to be able to, to uh, deal with the concepts of spiritual science in an organized way is very helpful because I based my work on the series of diagrams that, that crossed my desk, my desk uh, many, many years ago uh, that were watercolor uh, diagrams by Aaron Trick Pfeiffer, the student, direct student of Rudolf Steiner who founded Biodynamic Gardening. And, uh, but, so I call them the Grail diagrams and I added a great many more and uh but the full series is available in my second book which is still available i still have copies that's arcana of light on the path with a forward by the noted astrosopher and psychologist william bento the late willie bento good buddy and uh but you can get uh my book on ebay or if you're outside the U.S., you can contact me through private message on Facebook, or there's a link below for Academia uh, website. You can contact me through there. There's also links to uh, eBay to both of my books, even though it's one of them is going to tell you is temporarily out of print. And of course, if you want to buy me a cup of coffee, uh, that's PayPal.me forward slash John Barnwell eight at eight. And Joe, you haven't given me anything like that. So I, I can't share something like that with you. And, but I read other books too, you know? So it's like important to-, to Yeah, have we've, got, we've, got, we've got bookcases over here, bookcases everywhere, Rudolf Steiner, oh my God. <laughs> and you never, and for everybody out there thinking that you can to quantify this, it's a living thing and it's a beautiful thing. I couldn't live without it. I don't know how people live without it. And that's what happens. Yes, and I want to, and I want to thank, uh, put it, thanks out there. This podcast podcast is made possible by the generous support of Tyler and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and Tim and Neil and uh, Ray and Whitney and James and Marilyn and a lot of other people. And I want to thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. And uh, we're just trying to get the word out, so to speak. But uh, I look forward to speaking to Joe once again, because I think uh, we've probably created more questions than we did answers. And so we have to come back to try and resolve this, this naughty problem and uh, challenge, so to speak. And uh, But I, I can't thank you, Joe. You, you just have... You have a certain gift to be able to approach the subject in your own unique way, and I, I salute you for that. Thanks for having me, John. It's a blast. I love it. It's my pleasure. And uh, for everybody, uh, have a good week. <laughs>